I think you were standing like that, and Joe and Jez was there with his pram pointing down that way. Because I think if you'd have been looking at me, because I, I would have said something, because I would have said about, because Kate had been moaning that you'd been gone a long time watching the football. I'm almost certain that when I came out, I came <laughs> over and he was here. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. This is the second episode in a 10 part series debunking the claims and the sort of PR apologia narrative that is the popular Netflix series The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Make no mistake, in the McCann case, just as in the uh, Ramsey case, also the Amanda Knox case, what you actually have is a war going on between public relations and the truth or and reality. Um, and you kind of have also a battle for credibility. And, um, you know, I recently had a comment on the previous video from episode one where someone said, um, must we stomach your resume every bloody video you post as with the Watts case? And... Um, the answer to that is yes. The answer is um, one's credibility is very much in play when what you're trying to do is debunk, which is another way of saying discredit. And so it's very important to be able to say, um, these are my credentials, right? Um, I've written X amount of books about this. Um, these are the books. Go and look at the books. Prior to that, I wrote uh, magazine articles, those are my credentials as a journalist. Um, uh, prior to that, I studied at university. Uh, these are my educational credentials. Look at those, etc., etc. So one sort of trying to identify oneself as kind of an authority. And as an author, you always want to be seen as an authority. So somebody who um, is either irritated or dismissive of um, one push, pu putting your resume up um, is completely missing the point. Um, the point of debunking something like this is saying, um, uh, are these legitimate arguments against um, something that appears to be legitimate? And one of the ways that you make that argument is you say, um, do you think I'm legitimate? And here is something to look at where you can decide for yourself whether you think it's legitimate or not. And bear in mind when you're talking about just a somebody who to some people is a nobody and you are, you are sort of taking a narrative that's very well known around the world and it relates to uh, well-to-do doctors and you know, very rich, very influential people. Uh, in the in the Ramsey case, um, extremely wealthy, extremely influential people, and so one is completely justified in saying, "Well, who are you? Who are you to sort of come here and say anything? You know, you, you aren't anybody." And so, putting one's resume up to say, "Well, you've written all these books, you've had some of your stuff in the media," is a, is about trying to um, say, "Well." Who am I? Well, I am someone. I have written a little bit. Um, and to date, I've written uh, almost 100 books on the various cases. What I think someone like this either doesn't realize or pretends not to realize, or is just trying to be aggravating, is um, uh, an author like me is constantly being undermined, discredited, attacked in various forums. Um, and what people are trying to do is trying to make the case that um, your expertise is in question. So it, it may even be people who um, basically think the same thing. So, so there may be some people who have the same basic idea, say as true crime rocket science, say in terms of the Ramsey case or the McCann case. And so when you have the same people also attacking you, um, it gets even harder to sort of make this case for your credibility. And so one of the ways that I make my case for credibility is I say, look at my books, look at my work, 
Um, look at the average reviews for all of my work. Look at the, the reviews for my body of work. What do the reviews say? Um, what is the average rating of all of the reviews, right? And that's how I try to begin the argument to say, okay, maybe I'm trustworthy. Maybe you can listen to what I've got to say about this particular subject. It also works in the reverse direction. Um, I can't spend the amount of time I want to on these videos making the elaborate case for what I'm trying to make the case. There's a lot of details, a lot of sourced material, and instead of um, taking my word for it in a video, um, if you find what is said in the video acceptable, go and read the book that it refers to. Go and read the blog that it refers to. Um, all of the um, books and blogs um, are anchored in um, source material. It's not just thumb suck. Just as this video is also the, 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 the um, narration, the um, what you are hearing me say is anchored in a blog post which refers to specific um, uh, you know aspects of information. So credibility is a really big deal, and you know part of that big deal um, in trying to um, you know put up one's hand and saying you know I've got something important to say about the the McCann case. I went to uh, Portugal. Um, I spent some days there um, looking around. Um, I won't be really dealing with that so much in the series, but I will eventually get to it in due course. I will obviously touch on here and there when, when I'm covering certain things that ring a bell f you know, for, for things that I noticed when I was there, such as the shutters and the, the time that the sun went down and uh, certain topographical uh, aspects. I certainly will touch on them as we um, go through the series. Okay, and uh, I think without further ado, let's get started on episode two in the Netflix documentary. Although the second episode of the series is titled Person of Interest, Singular, it basically looks into two individuals, Robert Murat and Sergei Malinka. It's interesting that Robert Murat was quickly regarded as a prime suspect, despite having an alibi and despite no eyewitnesses placing him at the scene. Murat was neither implicated nor associated with the two sightings known as Tanner Man and Smith Man because he didn't resemble either of these figures in body shape, hairstyle, or even facially. Murat also has another rather obvious distinguishing feature, his glasses. Was Murat really a better subject to seize on than the folks staying at the hotel, including the McCanns themselves? So one thing that's interesting to note is when you look at Tanner Man, there's just nothing where the face is supposed to be. There, there's no moustache, there's no nose, there's, there are no eyes, and obviously there are no glasses either. So whether if someone had drawn eyes in it but no glasses, in a way you would have disqualified Murat. If you had um, drawn glasses, you would have um, kind of um, uh, implicated Murat, but once he was, um, you know, um, not exonerated, but... but um, no longer implicated, then you would be kind of in a pickle because who else are you going to find with glasses? So the fact that you left like a, bank, a blank slate where, where the face was of Tanner Man meant that for a certain amount of time you could sort of um, put all sorts of faces through that, that, that hole where the face was. And that is literally what happened for five years, um, even though somebody came forward uh, quite early on and said, hey, I'm Tanner Man, uh, um, a guy called... Dr. Julian Totman. Anyway, we will come back to Dr. Totman in episode 6 in this series. Murat also has another rather obvious um, distinguishing feature. It's um, the fact that he's sort of slightly blind in one eye, um, but uh, we also sort of deal with him uh, in due course. Um, there's an interesting article linked to in the Crime Rocket blog, um, My Life Caught Up in the Madeleine McCann Case, and it refers to a Russian computer expert that reveals the threats, blackmail, and bribery he faced after being quizzed as a, as a witness of the girl's disappearance. Um, for some time now, Malinka has been agitating about a book that is coming out. As of this writing, in March 2019, there is still no book. 
um, as of this episode, which is January 2020, there's still no book. Uh, I was contacted at one stage to work with and ghostwrite for Malinka. I've actually been contacted by quite a few people to ghostwrite um, in different um, areas and so on. Um, in this case, I wasn't contacted directly by Malinka, but by a third party. Uh, I turned down the offer. It seems I'm not the only one. Sorry to disappoint, but due to the content of the second episode, which basically focuses on Murat and Malinka, I won't be analyzing episode two because I consider both suspects to be debunked anyway. What I think is far more interesting to, to address is the gloss over of the timeline in episode one. The next blog will return to a chronological analysis of the remaining episodes over the next couple of days. So let's go to the Netflix timeline. The essential timeline is dealt with four, are you ready for it, less than three minutes total in the Netflix documentary, between um, 12 minutes and 15 minutes in episode one. It starts with the McCanns making their way down to the tapas bar at 2030, and they're the first to arrive. Um, it's also something that I um, put in a, in a clip in the beginning of episode one, um, that was the part that really stood out at me, that, that sort of three little minutes of um, somewhat credible argument or evidence. But there's no mention whether them being early or arriving first that particular evening was unusual compared to the preceding week. That's an issue I deal with in detail in the Doubt series. You want to look at um, the behavior the eating habits, the dining habits, and, and so on, not only of the McCanns, but of the top of seven as a group, um, not only on that night, but on, on the other nights preceding. And then you want to compare how the behavior on that night was different, uh, if it was, compared to um, the other nights. I do think it's quite interesting that... Um, the scenario given in the Apologia is that the McCanns arrive at the restaurant before anybody else. Bear in mind, they've got um, three children and they're kind of one of the sort of younger families in terms of um, overall children that are, that are quite young. So the fact that the McCanns kind of got everybody um, uh, washed and fed and ready for bed before anybody else um, is a little bit difficult to believe, especially since um, uh, Jerry McCann was kind of playing tennis till quite late in that evening. Um, in any event, um, according to the story, they were among the first to arrive. And what that then allows them, you know, this, this, um, the story of them arriving first also then kind of gives them the um, I won't say the excuse, but kind of the opportunity to be the first to kind of be excused. Since they arrived first, they can also sort of leave um, first and they sort of leave before, well, Jerry leaves before anyone's really even eaten. So they sort of arrive there, show their faces kind of like an alibi, and then Jerry sort of, um, I won't say disappears, but he gets up and he is then gone, right? The next time check is at um, 2100 hours when Matt Oldfield arrives at the restaurant, apparently volunteering the all clear that the McCann children were sleeping soundly. Matt Oldfield was very much in the picture immediately after Madeline's disappearance, as can be seen in these images. At 9.05, Jerry leaves the restaurant, presumably before eating anything, and it's unknown whether he'd ordered anything or what he ordered, if he did, to make his first and only check on the children that night. We see it dramatized how Jerry closes the door without closing it completely. In some descriptions, Jerry is so specific, he even describes how wide the door was opened down to the last degree. 
This is an important precursor to the actions of the door that follow. So one of the descriptions um, of Jerry um, entering the apartment, um, I believe comes from um, Kate's book, Madeline. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but it, it says that he enters, Jerry enters the apartment and sees that the children's bedroom door, which they've always left slightly ajar, is now open to 45 degrees. Thinking this is odd, he glances down into his own bedroom to see if Madeline has gone into her parents' bed. Now, I think this comes from some news report. I'm not quite sure which. And then he says, but he sees that all three are still fast asleep where the McCanns left them. Putting the door back to five degrees, he went to the toilet and then returned to the restaurant. This is the last time he would see his daughter. So this trip to the toilet is also not always mentioned when, when we get this version of events. The next time check given is 2125. It's made explicit that Kate intended to do a check, but was forestalled by guess who? Matt Oldfield, who volunteered to take her place. And right here is where the timeline goes wonky. Oldfield enters the unlocked apartment the same way Jerry did, by the side patio door and saw light and heard the sound, as if of a child moving in their blankets. Thanks to the door being open enough to perceive without really seeing, Oldfield is able to do his check without really doing his check. So he does a check, but without really doing a check. And so this is also where this... Um, uh, crazy sort of um, geometry where you, where you want to say how many degrees the door is open kind of becomes relevant because now you need someone else to go to the door but not open the door because the door is still open uh, as has been stated by x many degrees and um, if one of the kids was awake Oldfield apparently heard it but didn't look in to make sure if he had would he have seen Madeline in my opinion, Madeline was already dead at the stage, so she wouldn't have been in bed, but her body was likely still in the apartment. Her body was either in the cupboard of her parents' bedroom or behind the couch, based on cadaver alerts, or possibly laying in the flower bed below the balcony. It's also possible that immediately after Oldfield left, Madeline woke up, fell off the balcony railing or down the patio stairs and died. However, since it takes at least an hour for cadaver odor to form, it's more likely Madeline died earlier in the evening, prior to the McCanns leaving for dinner, than later. Cadaver traces were so strong that they were still picked up in late August, three months after the incident, and in spite of the apartment being cleaned numerous times, this strongly suggests her body um, remained inert or dead for some time before it was removed from the apartment. The Oldfield witness testimony is wonderfully inconclusive and murky because it doesn't confirm anything. Maybe all the kids were there and maybe they weren't. At the same time, Oldfield's entry into the narrative means the fact that neither McCann's checked on their brood is justified because a third party is given that responsibility, well, except that it doesn't check uh, to make sure. Also, the leaving of a door unlocked is justified to allow access to this known third party, this imputed um, intruder abductor, which also just incidentally understand paves the way for the abductor. So even in a scenario where Madeline could be proven to have died, who would be to blame? Where would it begin and where would it end? Whose testimony, assuming there was ever a trial to test this version, could be relied on one way or the other? The Netflix timeline picks up again at 10 o'clock. Kate gets up and heads to the apartment. Once again, the door becomes the central feature of her visit. There's something very strange about the door. All told, the documentary spends less than 2 minutes 30 seconds going through the critical timeline. There's virtually no analysis or explanation, no mention of several important witnesses within the timelines. 
Instead, the door, light and sounds are emphasized, supposedly confirming that everything was okay when it wasn't. Strangely, in another reconstruction of the door narrative, this one done inside the McCann's residence in Rothley, Kate seems to suggest the door was left virtually closed, but that when she approached it, it had opened quite wide and it then slammed shut right in front of her. This witnessed moving of the door and inconsistency of the door conjures the door as a sort of witness to an abductor um, who is not otherwise seen or heard and who doesn't leave um, any traces. That reconstruction can be viewed at 27 minutes 58 in the clip provided at the blog post. Interestingly, in her checking of the children, um, Madeline is missing, but no mention is made of the twins or who are also in the room, or whether they are awake or asleep or safe. And having just had one child stolen, apparently through the open window, what does Kay do? She abandons both children, runs out of the apartment, and raises the alarm, thus leaving the twins vulnerable to additional abductions. Another easy point to miss, immediately after Madeline disappears, an awful lot of running in general happens. Kate runs, and then, and I quote, everybody sprints back to our apartment. And I think this is a quote from Kate McCann's book, where she says um, something about them processing the information, and then she says, then they all jumped up from this, their chairs and ran towards me. She says, I remember Jerry saying, she must be there. By now I was hysterical. She's not. She's gone. Everybody sprinted back to our apartment. Now let's focus on a few observations in terms of the aspects the Netflix timeline explicitly doesn't address. So between 8.30 and uh, 10 o'clock, Jerry makes a total of one visit to check on the children, and according to Jerry, verifies that at 8.30, Madeline was alive and safe. This effectively makes this observation the last time Madeline was seen alive by any witness, assuming the observation is true and accurate. Number two, Kate McCann also makes a total of one visit to check on the children, when she does, the incident has already happened, so arguably Kate's visit doesn't count. One can say that technically in the space of 90 minutes, when the plan was to check on the children every 20 minutes, Jerry made the only check and only did so once. In 90 minutes, at least four checks ought to have been possible. It's not clarified what happened after Jerry's check. This is point number three. We know he checked, but there's not clarity on what time he was seen returning to the table. One way to establish this would be to look at what food he ordered when, whether he paid for it, and how much of the meal he actually ate that evening. Number four. In the police interviews, it's established that Jerry didn't go straight back to the restaurant after checking on his children. Instead, he is seen on the street by a witness, Jez Wilkins, at 2108. By the way, Jez Wilkins is a um, television producer. Uh, at 2108, that's when Jez Wilkins sees him, and then by Jane Tanner at 2110, at, at 10 past 9. What this, what this does is it pinpoints where Jerry is, giving him kind of an alibi there and then. So kind of what happens is Jerry goes to check on Madeline, and almost immediately when he steps out of the apartment, there are two people to kind of say, they, they, they saw Jerry, he didn't have anyone in his arms, and Jerry was just standing around, um, and, and that's where Jerry was, while the abductor was sort of roaming around and, and doing whatever he was doing. And so, yes, this gives Jerry an alibi there and then, um, while also allowing Jerry not to be where he's supposed to be, which is eating at the restaurant. The thing is, Jerry wasn't eating at the restaurant, and when he wasn't eating at the restaurant, other people saw him standing, talking, you know, in the darkened street um, uh, next to the restaurant. 
Point number five, Jane Tanner also very conveniently sees the prime suspect carrying away a child while at the time seeing Jerry in the street. Uh, as I say, who's not carrying anyone while he's talking to, to Jez. So what's quite incredible with Jane Tanner is at the same time that Jane Tanner kind of sees an abductor, she also sees Jerry. So what Jane's kind of saying is, um, I see Jerry and he, he's standing there and he's not holding anybody. And, um, and while I'm seeing Jerry, I also sort of see someone else carrying a child walking away but I can't really see his face so what I'm actually saying is Jerry's innocent and and then I, but I'm also seeing someone who's not innocent um, who could this other somebody be so Jane Tanner plays quite an important role in setting up the McCann narrative point number six 30 minutes pass and it's Kate's turn to check on the children during this interval, Jerry's movements aren't known precisely, and this is important. During this time, at approximately 9.50, the Smithman sighting occurs about five minutes' walk from apartment 5A. The man and the child spotted in the alley broadly fit both the father and Madeline's description, and the man is said to be walking briskly in the direction of the sea. In addition, the child in his arms don't appear... Uh, um, doesn't appear to be conscious and is being held awkwardly. Even the clothing of the child seen broadly seen broadly matches what Madeline was wearing the night she went missing. Um, I um, did a reconstruction of the Smithman route when I was in Pride de Luge um, at the time that I thought it happened and on the same date, um, but 12 years later. So um, late on the night of um, May 3rd. What I want to be explicit about is I didn't do my experimental walk um, close to 9 o'clock. I did it closer to 10 o'clock, closer to the Smithman sighting. And um, I will in due course reveal what I saw during my walk along the Smithman route, how long it took me to get there, how long it took me to get back, and where I went. Number seven, although Kate McCann is quoted in the documentary and in her book saying she ran out of the apartment and, and when she saw the table shouted, someone's, and that's singular, taken Madeline, others on the scene remembered it differently. One nanny described Madeline's mother shouting, they've taken her, um, they've taken her, in other words, plural. Another account from the Moyers couple, and this is hyperlinked in the blog post, who is staying two floors above the McCanns, quotes Kate shouting, um, the effing bastards have taken her. That's also plural. And wouldn't it have made more sense to simply shout the message from the balcony? In other words, you know, if you were in Kate McCann's position, wouldn't it have made sense just to shout, um, you know, and then for Kate, if she'd thought that Madeline had been taken out the window, to follow her out the window in other words to to run the other side to the other side of the apartment because isn't that where Madeline was taken right you know the McCann's kind of make the case repeatedly that the topper spa was within earshot and visual range you know so while they were eating, they could hear and see Madeline if, or, or any of the children if anything happened to her. And yet when Kate's at the um, apartment and something has happened, instead of shouting from there, and I mean, isn't she easily visible and, and, and audible? Instead of shouting from there, what she does is she runs back to the tapas bar. And um, also what this seems to imply is um, Kate McCann is briefly in the apartment, but then she runs out of it. And, and what is she saying? She's saying, well, I couldn't have abducted Madeline because I wasn't there for very long. You know, it wasn't like I went to the apartment and then shouted and then there was sort of a period of time where nobody saw me. What she's kind of saying is she goes to the apartment and then immediately runs out of it so that she can run back to it with everybody else. And that kind of also gives her an alibi. So 
Um, so that's definitely an interesting point. Point number eight, it appears that at no point did either of the McCanns contact the authorities themselves, even when a neighbor offered the use of her phone. Jerry dispatched uh, Oldfield relatively early at 10 past 10 to uh, head to reception and call the police. Okay, and that brings us to point number nine. Um, for several years, the focus of the media was on the Tupper 7 star witness account, uh, fingering Tanner Man, even though the cops had long since dismissed this theory. Meanwhile, Smithman was dismissed or disregarded by the McCanns in favor of Tanner Man and their private investigation into that sighting, well, was treated in a very different way to Tanner Man. Uh, the Sunday Times published the following apology on the 28th of December. In articles dated October 27th, Madeline clues hidden for five years and investigators had e fits five years ago. We refer to e fits which were included in a report prepared for private investigators for the McCanns and the fund in 2008. We accept that the articles may have been understood to suggest that the McCanns had withheld information from the authorities. This was not the case. We now understand and accept that the efforts had been provided to the Portuguese and Leicestershire police by October 2009. We also understand that a copy of the final report, including the efforts, was passed to the Metropolitan Police in August 2011, shortly after it commenced its review. We apologize for the distress caused. Now, what the Sunday Times was kind of getting at is was trying to say that um, the Smithman evidence had been withheld for five years and basically that the police had been uh, investigating Tanner Man um, when they should have been investigating Smithman. And you sort of ask why the Sunday Times would have made this error in inverted commas. Well, one of the reasons was the Sunday Times couldn't understand why the heck they would, why anyone, the McCanns and the um, police, would be investigating Tanner Man when, when there was another effort to be looking at, Smith Man. Um, it also didn't make any sense. Why would you have this faceless person um, when there was efforts with faces in them that, that weren't um, published in the media? And why were the police sitting on those efforts? And that that sort of certainly made things um, intriguing at the very least. And this brings us to the final point in the blog post. Um, a straightforward way to figure out who was where, when, and saw what, how, and why events played out in a particular pattern is for all the folks to return to the scene to do a recorded official reconstruction. And by, by that, what we mean is um, you know, if there's any confusion about uh, what Jane Tanner saw, if there's any confusion about, um, um, you know, the, the, the various chess pieces moving across the board, where was um, Jerry when that happened? Where was Kate when that happened? Where were the other members of the top of seven when this and that and that happened? Um, and it, it doesn't only include them, it also would include the restaurant staff and... Dr. Julian Totman and all the, all the different people. And what they want to do is put all the actors in the play and then see how it plays out. And that, that, that would be the obvious way to sort of try to figure out between this fabric of running around the hotel, when could the abductor have reasonably done what he was going to do? And so this really made sense. And um, the police wanted to do this and the media also wanted to do this. And interestingly, Jez, the television producer, he done reconstructions before. So why not do a reconstruction? Um, and when, uh, when, when the McCanns were asked to do a reconstruction, I think this was in 2008, so the following year, they kind of balked at the question. And uh, there's plenty of footage on um, YouTube, but I've also provided a link. Uh, the, the first link I provided has been removed online but there's another one that I've subsequently put up. You can look at how the McCanns respond to the, the mere idea of just doing a reconstruction. Now, bear in mind how much money they spent on this investigation 
And of course, they'll do anything to help further the investigation into the disappearance of their daughter, except participate in a reconstruction. I mean, what's the point? Right. So they didn't go and do the reconstruction in 2008. And then in 2009, they did. They did go and do a reconstruction. And this was for the media, for a television channel. And I don't think the police really, the Portuguese police really participated. So it was a reconstruction for the media, not for kind of a official investigation in terms of the local authorities. In the next episode, we'll be dealing with episode three in debunking the Netflix documentary. Um, I'm sorry if you had high hopes about episode two, but I'm simply not going to spend a lot of time uh, debunking Murat and Sergei Malinka just because there's, um, it's not, um, I don't want to sort of deal with debunking them. I want to deal with the issues around the Netflix documentary relating to the the McCanns. So I'm sorry if you feel let down by that, but the remaining episodes do deal with the Netflix episodes. Um, the trilogy that I've written, Doubt, Doubt 2 and Doubt 3, all deal with the um, uh, McCanns in terms of the timelines and um, all that kind of thing. It's sort of the McCanns are the focus of those narratives and the police investigation. What I purposefully excluded from those narratives for reasons of clarity was I kind of excised what the Tapa 7 said. I didn't want to muddy the narrative by looking at, well, this is what this one said and this is what that looked like and blah, 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 blah. So, so that's not in that trilogy. In Deep Into Darkness, I did the opposite. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to understand all the different versions of the Tapa 7. So Deep Into Darkness sort of examines the Tapa 7 version um, sort of up, up close and personal. And that, that distinguishes it very much from the um, Dao Trilogy. If you're interested in the coverage of the... Um, Netflix documentary, the debunking. You might also be interested in the debunking of the Killing of John Bonet podcast, which is currently being sort of broadcast. So as the episodes come up, um, I'm debunking them, and that's available on Patreon. So head over to Patreon slash TCRS, and um, I'll see you guys next time for episode three in TCRS debunks the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Thank you for listening. Let's go back and take part in a, a reconstruction. I'd say the, the prospect of going back with the world's media trying to watch a reconstruction doesn't appeal us and how emotional it, it is for us. Uh, mm. to